Good morning, everybody. I hope you guys can all hear me okay. You might notice I switched rooms. My older, my younger son went back to university, so now I'm using his bedroom instead of my other son's bedroom. So, um, so before we um, start talking about physics, just to talk a little bit about um, logistics this week. Um, let's see if I can find this. Here it is. Okay, so one thing I made an announcement about, one thing to um, just remind you all that um, it's good to um, regularly check the Canvas announcements because that's where I will be telling you things that are relevant to everybody in the course, okay, that are important. So I won't be sending out group emails, I put things on Canvas like this in announcements. Okay, so um, so one thing to notice is that, as we all know, hopefully, um, our first test is this Friday at 9.30 synchronously in class. Um, it'll be on Canvas, and I'll give you a lot more information about that um, in Canvas and in class on Wednesday. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out was I know some of you have Friday afternoon tutorials, which is unfortunate. We we had asked them in the past not to schedule them on Fridays, but anyway, we can't change it now. So, but if you're in a Friday tutorial and you would like to attend a tutorial earlier in the week because you think it might be helpful for you, they are going to be covering um, two-dimensional kinematics, which is a topic on the first test. So if you would like to go to the tutorial earlier in the week, that's fine. Just drop in to one of the other tutorial Zoom sessions. Okay, but please let your Friday tutorial TA know that you're going to be dropping in on um, a different tutorial section that week so that they can make sure that uh, your attendance. Yes, we do have a tutorial assignment this week. And it's already been posted in Canvas, so you should be able to find it. So are there any questions about that? So the test is up through the end of Chapter 3, so up through circular motion. OK, but it won't have um, any forces on it. Okay, any other quick questions before we start talking about physics? Yes, end of chapter three, exactly. Basically, if you look at what we covered in class, yes, projectile motion is on it. Um, what we did in class, what we, what we did in chapter two and chapter three is homework, okay? So um, I'll let you know how many questions. It's essentially, if you look at the practice midterm, it's going to be about half as long. So there'll be like five or six multiple choice questions, short answer questions, and you will have 40 minutes, yeah, for the whole test, and then one longer problem, OK? <laughs> look at the sample midterm, it'll be a similar difficulty, OK? All right, so now we're going to talk some physics. Remember, if you have logistical questions, now is not a good time to ask logistical questions. You should put those on Piazza, or you can come to office hours and ask them there. OK, so now we're going to talk some physics. Here we go. Oops, that's the wrong one. Nope, we got the right one. I just have the wrong one. So let me find my right window. There it is. Sorry, I'm being slow this morning. OK, so there we go. So we are moving on to um, chapter four, which will not be on this test. It will be on the next test. And as you probably saw from the pre-lectures, um, we're going to start looking at forces. And we start by looking, what are, looking at what are called um, Newton's three laws of motion. You've probably heard all about Isaac Newton. Um, I'm not going to get into the history of Isaac Newton. Um, there, there are a lot of um, famous stories about how he developed his laws of motion um, during the plague. So, so it kind of resonates with um, our lovely pandemic life right now. Not sure how much of that story is actually accurate, but anyway. So, um, so we are actually going to start with Newton's second law and then come 
back to his first law today, and then we'll do his third law next time. So, um, what does Newton's second law say? It says that the acceleration of an object is caused by the net external force on it. So if an object is accelerating, that means there's a net external force. How do you calculate that acceleration? You calculate it by um, taking the net force, which is a vector quantity, and dividing by m, the mass of the object on which that net force is acting. OK? So and we already know that um, acceleration is a vector 2. So you can see from this vector equation that the acceleration and the net force point in the same direction. So let's go through and um, just define everything clearly for this equation. So um, first thing to know is what's net force. So occasionally the word net pops up in physics. Um, what net means is total or sum of. So this is a way to write net force here. You write F net is equal to the sum of the Fi's from I equals 1 to N, which is basically just summing up all of the forces that are acting on the object. Okay, and we often number them. So you can see like our object here in the picture, which has a mass M, has four forces acting on it. Notice they're drawn as vectors because they are vector quantities. And so you draw a length to represent how big you think they are roughly, and you draw the direction in to show which direction the force is pointing. Okay, forces are essentially pushes or pulls on an object. They can be contact forces by something touching something else, or they can be forces at a distance um, like gravity or like the electrostatic force. Okay, and then you add up those vectors to get the net force. So for example, this is what the net force here might look like. Okay, you can kind of see if you look at the sizes of all these force vectors that force two and force three are roughly the same size, essentially the same size and point in opposite directions. So if you were to add those two vectors together, you'd get zero. And then if you were to add force one and force four together, right, F1 and F4, okay, you would end up with a net force pointing to the right. Okay, and that's the kind of thing we're going to be doing with our force problems is drawing all of our force vectors that we know are acting on our object, adding up the vectors to get the net force, and then we know the net force tells us the direction of the acceleration. Okay, because again, the acceleration is always in the direction of the net external force, and then the magnitude of the acceleration we're going to get from literally figuring out the magnitude of F net and dividing it by the mass of the object it's acting on. Okay, so again, that means in this case, if F net is to the right, then that means the acceleration of our mass M will be to the right. Okay, and so another thing to look at carefully um, is the units here. So we've already seen the units for acceleration. Um, which are meters per second squared, okay? So that means that when you take the force units and divide by the mass units, you should get um, meters per second squared. So what does that look like? So the force units are newtons. So the, the unit for the force was named after Isaac Newton. You're going to see as we go through the semester, lots of units are named after famous physicists of the past. And then our unit for mass is kilograms. So you're going to have newtons divided by kilograms. It must be equal to meters per second squared. So what does that mean? That means that, um, that a newton must be equal to a kilogram meter per second squared. All right. So what I thought we would do is um, try one of our FETs um, so we can have a look and just play around a little bit and see how this might work. So we're going to stop sharing this one for now. And we're going to switch over to one of our FETs. Okay, good. So 
So here's our, our FET that's called um, Force and Motion Basics. Um, this is the one that's called acceleration. You can see across the bottom of the screen that there's four options, net force, motion, friction, acceleration. Okay, so I'm going to start. We're not going to do, we're going to start talking a little bit about friction today. But for now, let's look at what happens if we turn friction off. So you can see they made the surface look like ice. Okay, and what we're going to look at, for example, is okay, I turned it on. He's pushing, so our little man is pushing with a force of 50 newtons to the right and you can see you've got a positive acceleration and if I were to crank it up to 100 you can see the acceleration is increasing I'm going to pause it there for a second so exactly what you would expect a positive fo applied force in this case the net force on the block okay gives us um, a positive acceleration Okay, and we can see what the sum of the forces here. They, like, they show you lots of different things. They show you the sum of the forces. If you want, you can look at the actual values of everything. So there are the actual values of the acceleration, the forces. You can turn on the masses if you want to. There's lots of things here you can turn on to have a look at what it looks like. Okay, so um, you can also flip the force and go the opposite direction. And then if we started going, now one thing to notice, it's still moving forward because it was moving forward before, but now it's decelerating, slowing down. And eventually it'll come to rest. And then with that negative acceleration due to the force pointing in the negative direction, it'll now start speeding up in the negative direction. Okay, so it's kind of fun to play around with this and get a feel for what forces do and how they act at different points and what happens when they act at different points. Um, and then you can also turn on friction here and that gives you an additional, so I'm going to pause this to start with, gives you an additional force to look at. So now we have a frictional force and an applied force and right now the sum of the forces is zero. And so you can see nothing happens, no acceleration. The sum of the forces is zero, even though we have two forces acting, okay? And then if we um, add um, even more applied force, eventually, as we'll see when we talk about friction, the applied force overcomes what we call the static friction, and we get a net force to the right, and the object will accelerate in the positive direction. And you can crank it up and make the acceleration even bigger. And then you can eventually turn that force back to zero. Oh, there goes the guy. And now all you have acting is the frictional force, and that will cause a negative acceleration, and the object will slow down. So, so you can play around with that. You can put different masses and so forth. And it gives you a feel for what it looks like when you have acceleration. So now what we're going to do is stop sharing that and go back to our slides. Actually, um, technically, friction can never be bigger than, than the implied force. The magnitude of the, the maximum static friction can be. Okay, so that's what we're referring to. Yeah, if, if your applied force is not, is smaller than the maximum static friction, then the object won't move. And we will talk about that when we talk about friction, which I believe will be not next time, but the class afterwards. Okay, so that was our Newton's second law. So I thought we would try a poll question on Newton's second law. So let's set this up. So we've only got three choices here. Okay, so the question is a force F is applied to a small block of 
blocks, a small block of mass m that pushes a larger block with a mass 5m. The two blocks accel accelerate to the right. What is the magnitude of the force F? And this, we're going to assume the surface is frictionless. So essentially, the only force acting, um, the no net external force acting on the two blocks is F. And notice we're looking for the magnitude of the force. So that'll be a positive quantity. Magnitudes are always positive. That'll be important when we start look, doing things in two dimensions. But I've, in my diagram, I've labeled both my force and my acceleration as vectors because they are vector quantities. And I'll try to be consistent about that. Okay, I think maybe we'll do about 10 more seconds on this one. So if you're not sure, go ahead and guess. Okay, we'll do five, four, three, two, one. And we'll see what everybody thought. Here we go. Okay, so what it looks like is that um, the largest group, 149 of you, think that the answer is C. All right, so let's see what it looks like here. So essentially, if both blocks accelerate together, then you can essentially treat them as one block of max 6m. And then we use our Newton's second law, which says that the net external force is equal to ma, okay? And since m is equal to 6m, f net must be equal to 6ma. So c was the correct answer. Well done, okay? So that's how you would use Newton's second law to figure that out, okay? And that's going to be true in some cases where if you've got one force acting on a system like this of two blocks, then you can treat the two blocks as one object. Okay, as long as they're not asking you for the forces in between the two blocks, then you have to be careful and you can't do that necessarily. All right, so now we're gonna try another poll question. This one's a little bit different. So let me set this one up. Okay, so we've got four choices for this one. So now, so we have a force F is, to, is applied to a block of mass 2M that pushes a smaller block with a, with a mass M. The two blocks accelerate to the right. What is the magnitude of the net force on mass M? And now we just, we want only the net force on mass M, the littler mass. And again, we're gonna assume the surface is frictionless. Okay, so we're looking for the net force not on both blocks combined. So this is where you have to be a little careful. But what is the net force on the smaller, the pink mass there?
And I guess one hint I can give you for this one is to think about what the acceleration is um, of the little mass. We know it's A, but what is A equal to? Okay, I think we're going to do um, 10 more seconds here. All right, so if you're not sure, go ahead and guess. All right, let's do five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and let's look at the responses. So there's a bit more um, diversity of opinions here or guesses about this one. Um, so um, let's have a look and see if we can figure out what the answer is here. So I'm going to hide that. Let's end the poll. All right. So what do we know? Well, we know that both masses accelerate at the same rate. And we can figure out what that acceleration is. It's just the net force divided by the total mass. So our acceleration here is equal to F over 3M. And then we know that um, in order for mass M to have this acceleration, the net force on it, basically F net, which equals MA, must be M times this acceleration. So we take the small mass m times the acceleration, which is f over 3m, and we get that the net force acting on the smaller mass must be f over 3. OK? So that's uh, an example, um, again, of using Newton's second law, using our f net equals ma. Um, in this case, we used it twice, once to figure out what the acceleration was for the two, the two block system, and then again to figure out what the net force on the smaller block must be. Okay? And it's kind of just being methodical about working through applying F equals MA to each object or group of objects as you go. That's, you'll see that that's what we'll do with a lot of problems. So, so our answer was D which I think the, the largest group picked D, so that was good. All right, so now we're going to do an example problem so we can see how this works um, in two dimensions. So say we have three horizontal forces acting on a block. F1 has a magnitude of 20 newtons and points east. Okay, so let's draw ourselves a north, um, south, east, west coordinate system. Now here's a case where it's okay to use north, south, east, west because they gave you north, south, east, west. OK, so F1 has a magnitude of 20 newtons and points east. So that's what F1 looks like. F2 has a magnitude of 20 newtons and points south. So this is what F2 look like, looks like. So um, if the net force on the block is 0, what is the third force? That's our question. OK, so we've drawn two of our forces. So if we know that the net force is zero, OK, so we can write this then. We, we're told there's three forces. So F net is the sum of the three forces as vectors. And we're told that that sum is equal to zero. So what does that mean? That means that if you do vector math, basically you subtract F1 and F2 from both sides of the equation, you get that the third force must be minus the sum of the other two forces. That way, all three vectors will add up to zero. All right, 
So um, let's have a look. Okay, so what does this look like? So this is F1, F2. Okay, so I moved F2 over so that the tail of F2 is on the tip of F1. Okay, so this is what F1 plus F2 looks like. Okay, so now we don't want F1 plus F2. We want minus F1 plus F2. So that looks like this, because remember when you do minus, it's a vector with the same magnitude, but in the opposite direction. So, and that must be what F3 looks like, right? Because F3 is equal to minus F1 plus F2. Okay, so we just have to figure out now what is um, the third force. And now when someone asks you, what is the third force? and you know that you're trying to find something that's a vector, then you need to find either the two components, okay, or you have to find the magnitude and the direction. And usually in a problem, I will either ask you what are the components of the force, you know, the X and Y components, or in this case, it could be like the East and North components, or I will ask you what's the magnitude and what's the direction. In this case, let's solve for the magnitude of F3 and the direction of F3. So the magnitude is pretty straightforward. Okay, we know that both of our vectors have a magnitude of 20. And since they're both the same, that means that the angle here, okay, that the angle that F3 makes with what you might call the west axis has to be 45 degrees. Okay, because if the two sides are the same, that tells you you have a, a 45, 45, 90 triangle. So this is where we start ha having to remember a little bit of our geometry or our trigonometry. So the two legs, um, F1 and F2, are both 20 newtons. And so we do Pythagoras to get the magnitude of the vector, and we get 28 newtons. OK, and then, like I said, the angle has to be 45 degrees because both of those components, those legs of F3 are the same length. And then how do you define it? Okay, well, since it's pointing upwards, so in this case, which means along the northerly direction, okay, and it's pointing away from east, which means it's in the westerly direction, and it's halfway between north and west, you can say 45 degrees north of west. You could have also said 45 degrees west of north that would have also worked as um, a valid angle. Okay, so, right, and we know this is 45 degrees because those two forces are the same size. If they weren't the same size, you could figure out that angle, right, between um, basically between F1 plus F2 and the east axis by um, using your trigonometry. And we'll do some examples like that in the future. Yes, yeah, so you could also say 135 degrees from what? From east. You just have to specify it. I would say my rule is usually make sure you specify it correctly with words or make sure you draw a correct picture. Either of those will work. Okay. All right. So let's talk some more about forces. So as you'll see as we go through and do a variety of problems, there are some forces that show up a lot. Okay. So the first one that shows up a lot is the force due to gravity, which were um, the pre-lecturers, they like to label it with a little W because um, we also refer to it as the weight of an object. So this is the force, the weight of an object or the force due to gravity that causes objects in the absence of air resistance to accelerate towards the center of the earth with an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so this is this is where that acceleration, that constant acceleration due to gravity comes from. It comes to because basically um, we are living on a very large mass called the Earth and objects with mass attract each other. And we'll probably get into that later. Okay, and this is the attractive force between, like in this case, the mass of the soccer ball and um, the Earth. Okay, you also get gravity on other planets. We've already played around with that a little bit. So, um, so the weight, the magnitude of the weight then is 
get that, we can get it from Newton's second law, it's mass times acceleration, so it's always going to be the mass of the object times g, okay, where g is our 9.8. So here's another example where g has to be a positive quantity because we're using it to define the magnitude of the weight, the magnitude of the force due to gravity, which is w. Okay, so normal force. Normal force is a force that happens between surfaces, okay, and it's always perpendicular to the surface between two objects where they touch, okay? In most cases, they'll touch for some reasonable area, so you'll be able to figure out what that is. Sometimes they only touch at a point, and then it would be at that point, okay? So, um, and so the word normal in math actually means perpendicular. So that's why we call this one the normal force. So here's an example. Um, here's a book sitting on a table, okay? And so we know that um, the force due to gravity is acting on the book, right? And if that table weren't there, the book would fall, it would accelerate, right, towards the earth. But there is a surface, a table in between um, the uh, book and the floor. Okay, and that table exerts an upwards normal force that's perpendicular to the surface of, between the book and the table. Okay, so here's an example where, um, again, the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface, but now we have a, a, a surface at an angle. We have what's called an inclined plane here. Okay, so we're at an angle, and they, they played around with this a bit in the pre-lecture, so I'm not going to dwell on this too much, um, but the main thing to notice here, okay, is that the normal force is perpendicular to that angled surface, and it's not opposite the weight in this case, because the weight will always point vertically downwards towards the center of the Earth. Always, always, always. So as long as you know where the center of the Earth is, you know where the ground is, you know which way the weight's going to point. And then, but the normal force itself is going to depend on the angle of that surface, whether it's horizontal, like our table, whether it's at an incline, like our inclined plane, or sometimes you even get normal forces that are vertical. Okay, if you push against your hand vertically, your hand will push back with a normal force. Okay, that's horizontal. All right, so it's good, it's good to keep in mind that normal forces um, vary depending on the scenario you're looking at. All right, what other forces do we have? Um, frictional force, which, I, like I said, we're going to come back to and look at in a lot more detail later on. Okay, just, so for now, um, typically we'll write frictional forces as little f's, and as we're going to see in the future, there's different kinds of friction, whether the object's at rest or it's sliding. But the main thing to remember about a frictional force is it's always opposite the direction of motion, the direction of the sliding, or the direction of attempted motion if the object is not moving. Okay, so because there can be frictional forces that basically stop something from moving, that make it hard. We saw that with our with the FET, right? That you could push on an object. Um, and it won't move if your frictional force isn't big enough to overcome. So if your pushing force isn't big enough to overcome the frictional force that's acting on the object. Okay, so just to remember, it's always opposite the direction of motion or attempted motion, because you get it in both cases. And it's quite, friction is actually complicated. Physicists are still trying to figure out exactly. It, it's um, got to do with, um, literally atomic forces between atoms on the two surfaces uh, interacting electrically. Okay, that's where friction comes from, and it's actually quite complicated. And we typically, we, we, we simplify it quite a bit at this level of physics. All right, the last um, force we're going to look at is tension. Now, tension is an interesting one. Tension is what you get in ropes and cables and wires and things that are dangling. Okay, here's um, an example of... Um, three blocks um, being pulled, and you can see that um, 3M and 2M, those two blocks are atta attached by a rope that has a tension we're going to call T3, and block 2M and block M are attached by another rope that has a different tension, not necessarily the same tension as tension 3, and then the first block, little block M, has a tension T1 pointing to the right. 
Okay, and so and we're told that this whole system is accelerating to the right. So this is kind of a typical tension problem. We're going to play around with these, I think, on Wednesday, um, looking at how you analyze these systems. Because the weird thing about tension is the direction it points depends on um, which end of the rope you're looking at. Okay, for example, if you look at this tension two here, it's pulling on pulling to the right on mass 2m, but it's pulling to the left on mass m. And a similar thing is happening with tension 3, where it's pulling to the right on 3m, but it's pulling to the left on 2m. But we'll get into that in a lot more detail when we do actual um, tension problems. But those are some of the, the uh, kinds of forces, as your, your book refers to most of them as contact forces, except for gravity, which is not. So um, anyway, so those are our forces. So if you want to do um, a force problem, you want to draw what's called a free body diagram. Okay, this is a way of, of illustrating the forces that are acting on your object. Okay, so here's an example um, of a person pushing a, a box across a floor, and it looks like it's a frictionless floor. Okay, and the important thing is you want to identify the forces acting only on the box. So in this case, what forces do we have? We have an upwards force that um, is labeled the force of the floor on the box, and that would be our normal force, okay? So that's the floor pushing up on the box, okay? And then we have a force pointing downwards, which is the force of the earth on the box, okay? That would be the weight, right? Because where does the weight come from? It's the earth pulling on the box, okay? And there's friction here, so we don't see a sideways force of the surface on the box. And then we have what I labeled the push force, okay, which is the force of the man on the box. And so when I draw free body diagrams, I tend to draw them as just a bunch of arrows um, coming out of a point like that, okay? So that's, a, you know, a generally a good way to draw these things. All right, so here's another example problem to do where we'll, we will draw a free body diagram. Okay, so we have a block that's being pulled across the floor. Okay, and you can see we have a force F acting on the block, okay, that makes an angle theta with the horizontal. And we're told that the block is accelerating. You can see in the picture the block is accelerating to the right, okay, with an acceleration A. And so we're trying to figure out one, what's the acceleration of the block? And two, what is the normal force on the block? Okay, so let's draw a free body diagram. So I'm gonna start with my normal force, which points upwards, okay? And then what else do I wanna do? Well, we also know that there's gravity or the weight acting downwards, okay? And then what other forces do we have acting? Well, the only other force we have acting is our force F. Okay, so there's my, my free body diagram. Now that's mostly complete. I like to add to my free body diagram an XY coordinate system. Just like we did with other kinematic problems, you really wanna have an XY coordinate system so that um, you can determine components of vectors and so forth. So let's draw in our XY coordinate system. And just like we did with kinematics, I'm typically gonna have my positive y direction be upwards and my positive x direction to be, in this case, um, since I know the acceleration is going to the right, I'm gonna draw it in to the right and the positive, the direct, so that'll be my positive direction. Okay, so that my acceleration will be positive in the x direction. Okay, so yes, there is no friction in this one. Generally assume there's no friction unless they tell you otherwise, okay? That we'll make it pretty explicit when there's friction. Okay, so what's the acceleration of our block here? Okay, so what do we know? So first thing I do, you do, since it's a two-dimensional problem now, is to realize that you can rewrite Newton's second law in terms of components. So the sum of the forces in the x direction equals m times the x acceleration, and the sum of the forces in the y direction equals the mass times the y acceleration, a y. Okay, so question for you. Um, can anyone tell me um, 
which forces of those three forces, which of those have an X component? Of the normal force, the weight, and F, which ones have X components? Yeah, so F. F is the only one that has an X component, right? And we know how big that X component is. It's equal to F cos theta, right? Because it's theta is the adjacent angle there. So the X component of F is F cos theta. So if we do our first um, summation equation, first second Newton's second law equation there, we know that the sum of the forces in the X direction, there's only one force with an X component, that's F, and that X component is F cos theta, and that must be equal to the mass times the X acceleration. Okay, and then we can solve for the acceleration in the X direction, that's just equal to F divided by M cos theta, right? And that, because that's the only acceleration, okay, if they don't say anything about the block jumping off the ground, if it's being sliding across the floor, then that acceleration, that is the magnitude of our acceleration. So you would say our acceleration is F over M cos theta to the right is a good way to specify it. All right. So that is um, how you would figure out the acceleration. The next question is, what's the normal force? Well, to figure out the normal force, you have to look at the y components, right? Because the normal force is in the y direction. And so that means we need to figure out the y component of F. And so the y component of F is just F sine theta. So now we know that, and now we can sum up the forces in the y direction and set them equal to the mass times the y acceleration. And that looks something like this. Okay, and so what do we have? We have a normal force, N, and it's positive here. Now notice these are the basically the components of the forces here, right? So we have a normal force, that's the magnitude of the normal force, it's positive because it's pointing upwards. We have minus mg, that's for the weight. The minus sign is because the weight points downwards. Okay, the weight has a negative y component. And then we have plus F sine theta because the y component of the force F is positive. So that's a positive there. Okay, remember N itself, M, G, F, those are all positive quantities. You put the signs in. I always put the signs in explicitly so you can see the signs. Okay, so now we solve for the normal force using this. And then notice I set this whole thing equal to zero here. Why? Because the acceleration in the y direction is zero, because the block is not moving up and down. It's only moving sideways. Okay, and so if you set that equal to zero, then you can solve for your normal force. And what do you get? You get um, mg minus F sine theta. So the normal force, notice, it's less than the weight, right? Which is what they said in the pre-lecture, in the bridge question, right? I believe it was, right? The weight would be mg, but the normal force is less. Why is it less? Well, that's because the force F is partially lifting the block off the table and since it's partially lifting the block off the table a little bit okay then the table doesn't have to supply as much support force to stop the block from falling towards the ground so you don't have as much support force basically the block is pushing less hard on the table so the table is pushing less hard on the block okay that's actually um, something we're going to talk about next time when we talk about Newton's third law Okay, but you can imagine if you're partially picking it up a little bit, right, then the normal force will be less. Okay, so that's a typical two-dimensional force example for um, which we will play around with similar things. Okay, and that's a, just, just a nice indication to realize that the normal force is often not mg. Okay, that it often has a different value, especially if there's some other force in there that has a vertical component like F does here. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about for the last five minutes is Newton's first law, okay, um, sometimes called the law of inertia. And Newton's first law says an object at rest tends to stay at rest and an object in uniform motion tends to stay in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by a net force. Okay, so in a way, this is sort of a statement of a special case of Newton's second law. It's essentially saying that if the net external force acting on an object is zero, then the acceleration is zero. 
and if the acceleration is zero, then the velocity of the object is constant, okay? And that might seem really simple now that you know Newton's second law, but that was not actually known for many years. It was um, very confusing to people. They thought that for an object to move at a constant velocity, a force had to be acting. And now we know that's not true. You need forces to accelerate objects. You do not need forces to have an object move at a constant velocity. And that's a really, really fundamental, important thing to remember. Okay, and they did a nice job of explaining that, I think, in the pre-lecture. So um, I thought we would do one more, because I think we have time here. Okay, one more poll question. So I will set this up while you read it. And this relates back to um, what we did last time on circular motion. And we've got what? We've got four choices here. Okay, so let's talk about the scenario here. So we have a child swinging a ball at the end of a string in a circle on a frictionless horizontal surface. So imagine something is going around horizontally. Okay, it's a ball on a string. And the question is, if the string breaks so that the resultant force on the ball, okay, the net force suddenly drops to zero, okay, in which direction will the ball move? Okay, will it continue in a horizontal circular path? Will it move directly towards the center of the circle? Will it move directly away from the center of the circle? Or will it move in a direction that is tangent to the circle at the time the string breaks? Those are your choices. So one thing you have to remember now is um, for uniform circular motion, we knew there was an acceleration, right? We had our centripetal acceleration. So think about which way the centripetal acceleration points and then what would happen to the centripetal acceleration if the string were to break? Because in this scenario, it's the tension in the string that's um, creating the, the force, is creating that centripetal acceleration. Okay, I think we're going to do about 10 more seconds here because we're running out of time and I want to make sure I have time to um, explain the answer to this one. So um, if you're not sure, go ahead and guess. Okay, let's do five, four, three, two, one. And let's see what everybody thought. All right. So we have lots of agreement on this one with lots of people who think it's D. Okay. And in fact, well done. It is in fact D. It, it will move in a direction that is tangent to the circle at the time the string breaks. Why is that? So there's my string breaking and that's what the path would look like. Why is that? Well, according to Newton's first law, when the net force on an object is zero, its velocity will be constant. So in this case, um, what happens is what, as soon as the string breaks, then the net force on the object is zero, and the velocity of the ball will stay the same as the value it had right when the string broke. And the value it has right when the string breaks is tangent to the circle. So the ball will go flying off in that tangent direction as soon as that string breaks and that tension force that was keeping it moving in a circle disappears, then off it goes 
in that tangential path. Okay, so we're going to stop there. I know a few people had a couple questions on one of the earlier slides, and I'm happy to try and go over that. Uh, Sarah, can you also go to the um, to the X and Y components in example one? All right, let's go back to example one. I think I'm also going to stop the recording right now so I don't forget. Let me just do that really quickly.